Brothers and sisters, in today's khutbah, I wanted to address the difficult and sensitive topic about how we deal with the failures of our community leaders, scholars, clergies, du'at, etc. It is an uncomfortable topic, but one that needs to be addressed. And some of you, brothers and sisters, know why we're addressing this in today's khutbah. Some of you are aware of the incidents that recently took place, uh, and some of you are not. And that's okay, and we don't need to get into the details of it. It's not appropriate for the mimbar. But high level, what everyone is probably aware of, is that one of the most famous and well-respected Quran teachers, Quran reciters in the United States of America and maybe the Western world committed some of the most heinous and atrocious and shocking acts that we have ever heard of. And this incident has sparked conversations throughout our community about what it means to deal with spiritual abuse, how do we strengthen our faith around these topics, and how do we become better Muslim, Muslims and worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these trials and tribulations. This individual, brothers and sisters, he taught over 2,500 people the Quran. He was considered by his peers, his fellow scholars, to be one of the best Quran reciters. Everyone is distancing themselves from him now, which is understandable and should happen. But people, he, he had stamps of approval from many organizations and from many scholars. He was a master outwardly of tajweed, outwardly, but inwardly it fell short, brothers and sisters. And on a personal level, this hits personally. I met this individual multiple times. I talked to him multiple times. My brother attended multiple of his classes. Uh, my cousin went and played basketball with him every Friday, just like, you, like any of your kids would. My cousin went on hajj with this individual. He slept on the sacred grounds of the Holy Lands during Hajj with this individual. He was on Arafah with this individual, uh, raising his hands next to him on Yom Al-Arafah. So on a personal level, this hurts very much, and it's very shocking, and it's very disturbing. And it has driven many scholars in our community to uh, deliver a khutbah on what is spiritual abuse. <clears throat> so brothers and sisters, in order to begin, we have to define what is spiritual abuse? What is the definition of spiritual abuse? In short, spiritual abuse is the misuse of religious or spiritual authority to control, manipulate, or, har or harm others for personal gain. That is the short and quick definition. What does this look like? It often involves exploiting a person's faith, beliefs, or trust in a spiritual leader or institution to exert power over them, leading to emotional, psychological, or spiritual harm. This can lead, this can include coercion, guilt tripping, or distorting spiritual teachings for personal gain or control. We have all experienced spiritual abuse at a very, very low level, right? So many of us, if you're in the Desi community, if, you, if, you, if you're Desi and your, your, your grandparents watch the Desi dramas, or you watch Turkish dramas, there's always this, uh, in every drama, there's this scene where the matriarch of the family, the nani or the dadi or something says to their son, you know, if you don't do this for me, I'm not going to make dua for you. Right? If you don't do this for me, I'm not going to make dua for you. Or if you don't do A, B, and C, I'm going to do bad dua, make dua against you. And you don't want that because the dua of a parent is accepted. This at a very low level, brothers and sisters, is spiritual abuse. At a very low level, it is weaponizing the deen to get what you want from an individual. That is at the very low level. And we chuckle and we move on and that's good. But it can happen at a very high level, like what I just addressed at the beginning of the khutbah with this very famous and well-respected individual at the time. And we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that spiritual abuse has been happening during the Prophet Prophet's time. The Prophet dealt with this himself. And the best example of this is Musaylama al kadhab some of you may know of Musaylama al kadhab and some of you may not know who he is. He was an individual that near the end of the Prophet ﷺ's life, he claimed to be a prophet of God as well. And he actually sent a letter to the Prophet ﷺ saying, from Musaylama Rasulullah, from Musaylama the Prophet of God, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. He claimed to be a prophet of God with the Prophet ﷺ. And in this letter he said to the Prophet, he said, you know, I am sharing this burden with you. I am sharing this burden with you of spreading this deen to the masses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you half the world and he's given me half the world to call people to Islam too. 
And so the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with this individual. He was someone that used people's faith, twisted it and manipulated it for his own personal gain. And the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they dealt with him. And now throughout history, he is known as Musaylama al-Kadhab, Musaylama the liar. And he has been disgraced. We don't have time to go into his story in today's khutbah, but is an example of how the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with this as well. And brothers and sisters, we have an epidemic of this in our community, but we don't want to talk about it, right? Yaqeen Institute, one of the foremost Islamic think tanks in the United States, did a poll where they polled 700 Muslims, 700 Muslims, and out of the 700 Muslims that they polled, they found that 22.5% of them had experienced intimate physical abuse before the age of 18. Physical intimate abuse is a fancy way of saying something else, but we have young kids in the audience, so we're not going to say it. But physical intimate abuse, before the age of 18, 22.5%. So this is something, brothers and sisters, that is happening in our community, and we have to address it, and we have to talk about it. And we have to overcome some arguments from individuals who might not you know, understand. Many people will say, you know, this is something, spiritual abuse is something that takes place in the Catholic Church. It takes place with Buddhists. It takes place with uh, every religious group, you know, and it's as old as time, and it's a human problem. Why do we have to discuss it? We have to discuss it, brothers and sisters, because we have a responsibility as Muslims to uphold justice and truth and to play a role in having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to protect this deen. That's number one. Number two, people say, you know, you can't stop a motivated predator. You can't stop a motivated predator. Rules are meant to be broken. And the response to that is, unfortunately, that is a defeatist mindset. It's a defeatist mindset. We have to actually take steps and at least try. And why do the Western worlds have so many regulations in place, but when it comes to Muslim communities, we don't? It's something that we should reflect upon. We should be leading the charge on this, brothers and sisters. So in today's khutbah, brothers and sisters, I want to distill three myths, three myths that we must break when it comes to this topic. Um, Islam is a religion that has come to break idols and to break myths and so let us break some of these myths. Myth number one, brothers and sisters, myth number one is that scholars can't sin. Scholars can't sin. This is myth number one. This is a myth. It is not true. Our scholars and our re religious leaders can sin. Even I, I'm giving the khutbah today, I might have sinned on my way to the mimbar today and I don't even know about it. These small minor sins, Allahu Alam, we don't know. Right, we don't know. Everyone can sin and this is an aqidah issue that we need to address. As Sunni Muslims who are part of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, it is baked into our creed, it is baked into our aqidah that no one after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ma'asum. No one after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, is masum. Everyone can sin. Only the Prophet ﷺ was infallible. And all the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are infallible. But everyone after the Prophet ﷺ or even hit, or besides the Prophet ﷺ can and does sin. And this is a very important aqidah issue that we need to understand. Even the Sahaba Akram, even our beloved Sahaba, even they could sin. Right? And this is something that has to be mentioned. It might make some individuals uncomfortable. If it makes you uncomfortable, ask yourself why. Perhaps our aqidah has become a little disoriented and we have to shift it back to the middle. We are Sunni Muslims here. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is baked into our creed. We might have some Shia brothers and sisters here. That's fine. That's amazing. Uh, they have a different creed. They have 12 Imams. They believe that they're infallible. We as Sunni Muslims, we do not believe this. This is very, very important to correct our aqidah and to correct our creed on this myth. So our scholars can sin and they do sin. It's something that we need to understand. And we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that the shayateen, the devils, they don't just stop at you and me, the average everyday Muslim. They don't just stop at you and me. They work twice as hard with the big scholars as well. Shaitan is always trying to make an impact, get the most bang for his buck. If, he, if shaitan, Iblis, leads one person astray, he leads one person astray. But if he's able to lead a scholar astray, then he's able to lead a whole community astray and create a lot of fitna. So this is something we have to understand is the shaitan doesn't just stop. Oh, his tajweed is very good, I should stop. Oh, he studied aqidah and fiqh, I should just stop. Oh, he has a million followers on YouTube that are listening to him recite Quran, I should just stop. No, as a matter of fact, the shayateen are working just as hard with these individuals as well. And we ask for protection for everyone, including our scholars, Amin. And we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that many of us have this belief that the sharia rules don't apply to our scholars like they apply to us. I'll give an example, right? So all of us know the sharia, right? We all know the sharia. We all know the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where he tells us that a man and a woman cannot be alone together, 
right? If a man and a woman are alone together in khalwa, the third counterpart, the third person with them is shaitan. We know this hadith, all of us know this. And we understand this and we internalize this and we implement it in our everyday life. But when we catch wind of maybe an imam, mufti sahab, hafiz sahab, qari sahab, someone who is alone with the opposite gender, then we make excuses. We say, you know, they're qari sahab, they're mufti sahab. It doesn't apply to them. But it does apply to them, brothers and sisters. It does apply to them as well. <clears throat> and it applies to all of us. The Sharia is our benchmark, brothers and sisters. So this is myth number one that we need to uh, address. Myth number two, brothers and sisters. Myth number two is that we must protect scholars and their faults to protect the deen. We must protect scholars and faults and their faults to protect the deen. This is a very common myth and it is something we need to address. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ghayra over his deen. He has protective jealousy over his deen. Right? Not jealousy like you and me in no anthropomorphic sense, but he does have protective jealousy over his deen. And he will protect his deen in any way he sees fit. And he has been protecting this deen since the beginning of time. And he will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to protect this deen. So we don't have to believe that, oh, we must protect, the, protect individuals' faults or uh, push things under the rug. No, rather, brothers and sisters, um, this, this is something we have to address. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ghayra over his deen and he will protect his deen. This doesn't mean that we go on a witch hunt that we're trying to expose people's faults. No, 70 excuses still applies. Husn al-dan still applies. But what this means practically, brothers and sisters, that if we, if we hear of some, something multiple times, right? there's an English saying that's very important, where there is smoke, there is fire. Where there is smoke, where there is fire. So if we're hearing multiple times, multiple compl complaints of an individual or something going on in our community, it is our responsibility to responsibility to go and investigate and see what is going on and this is a responsibility Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as Muslims to be upholders of justice and truth so we don't push things under the rug but rather when there is smoke there is fire we go to investigate to protect those that are most uh, vulnerable in our community so that is myth number two and myth number three brothers and sisters myth number three is that you as a regular Muslim can't speak on these issues and have no insights on these issues. You as a regular Muslim don't have insights into these issues because it's above your pay grade. This is myth number three that we have to distill, that we have to disperse, brothers and sisters. We have to get rid of it. The Prophet wasallam said in an authentic hadith narrated by Abu Umama, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Rasulullah wasallam said, beware of the insight of, a, of the believer, for verily he looks with the light of Allah. Beware of the insight of a believer, for verily he looks with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, there might be a spiritual co component here, that we as Muslims have something called basira, have insight, spiritual insight, where we can be able to discern between right and wrong in individuals. What this means more practically, brothers and sisters, is that we have to trust our gut. Another English saying, we have to trust our gut, and we have to learn to trust our gut, or to trust our sixth sense. Our youth today, they like to say, you know, I, my spidey senses are tingling, or there's a disturbance in the forest. Whatever way you want to say it, you can say it. But the point is, is that we as Muslims have the ability to discern between right and wrong, and, and to discern between people who make us comfortable and people who make us uncomfortable. This doesn't mean we go and smear people's names, but it means that we protect our families and protect ourselves. And we want to pause for a moment and speak to the men, right? The men, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the community, uh, in the Quran, Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa the men are the caretakers, providers, and protectors of women. And it is our job as men to be the protectors and providers and caretakers of our families. And to have this ability to have our sixth sense, to trust our gut, to be able to say, you know what? My family shouldn't maybe be taking from this individual. I will be the gatekeeper of where they get their spiritual knowledge from. I am okay with this individual and this individual, but I'm not as okay with this individual and this individual. That doesn't mean you go around and you smear people's names, but it means that you are being that, product, that protective floodgate for your family, protecting the influences that come to them. So this is something that we really need to focus on. There's a story in the life of Uthman radiallahu an. After the Prophet وسلم, passed away, Abu Bakr passed away, Umar passed away, may Allah be pleased with both of them, Uthman radiallahu an was the next Khalifa. And he wasn't just a political leader, he was also the spiritual leader of his time. And he was having a majlis, he was having a majlis, a gathering of the brothers sitting together. And as he was sitting with the brothers, someone came to the gathering late. 
the individual walked into his gathering and they walked in late. And Uthman radiallahu an stopped his gathering. He stopped what he was doing. And he looked at this individual and he said, you come to this majlis after sinning? You come to this majlis after sinning? In other words, he's saying, hey, you were just sinning and you're coming to, our, to the majlis now? How do you have the audacity to do that? And this individual, he pushed back against Uthman radiallahu anh. He pushed back in front of everyone. And he said to Uthman radiallahu anh, he said, What is this, Ya Amir al Mu'minin? Is this wahi? Is this wahi? In other words, he's saying, What is this? Are you claiming to have revelation? How do you know I was sitting? How, how do you know I was sinning? You're not the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wahi only comes from, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can you say that, you know, I'm sinning? And Uthman radiallahu an responded to him, this is not wahi, but be a, beware of the insight of the believer. Beware of the insight of the believer. I'm sharing this story, brothers and sisters, not to say that you know, we're going to have some superpower to be able to see the sins, of individuals, uh, on the, the sins of individuals on their faces or things like this or have you know, this superpower or something. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying rather is to highlight what Uthman radiallahu an was telling us, which is to beware of the insight of the believer to trust our gut and to trust ourselves inshallah aquli qouli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna 'ala an-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu 'alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli 'ala sayyidina Muhammad wa 'ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita 'ala sayyidina Ibrahim wa 'ala ali sayyidina Ibrahim innaka Hamidum Majid Alhamdulillah thumma alhamdulillah we have uh, such a beautiful religion and such a special religion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the sharia as benchmarks, as protections against uh, these things happening. And so we have to return to the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have that be our benchmark as how we judge between people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq. Brothers and sisters, in the second part of the khutbah, I wanted to quickly address a few steps that we can take as a community to start to uh, curb against this phenomenon that is taking place, not just in our community, but across uh, across the world. And so some things that we can do, very practical steps that we can do, brothers and sisters, is number one, we can have <clears throat> all our teachers that are teaching kids, young kids, we can have them all take the mandated reporter training. It's called the mandated reporter training. It's given by the state of California. Everyone should partake uh, in this type of uh, training, which allows them to be able to discern against abuse and figure out what's right and what's wrong. Number two, you can fingerprint, right? As a community, we can start to fingerprint our teachers and deliver it to the State Department so that if, God forbid, something does happen, there's a quick turnaround that can be done. Number three, we can have 24-hour surveillance in, in rooms where there is privacy between individuals. This is something that we should do. For the regular Muslim, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching. For these people, they don't care about that. So you, they need to have 24-hour surveillance to be curbed against this. And then last but not least, we can implement different bylaws uh, that have been promoted to us by the Hurma Project, which is a third, uh, third party or Muslim organization which is addressing uh, this, type of, uh, this type of subject. And so these are the, some of the different things that we can do as a community to help curb against uh, these things. But brothers and sisters, um, th number five, the fifth thing that we can do, brothers and sisters, is that we can start to uh, have the same level, high level bar that we have for our scholars, that we have for our doctors, for example. The other day, I went to go get uh, my eyes checked uh, from the eye doctor. And, you know, I walked in, it was a new office, I'd never seen this doctor before. I walked in and right away I saw four different diplomas hanging on the wall. Four different diplomas hanging on the wall, showing where this doctor went to, to school, how many years he had been doing his training, and the different institutions that signed off on him being able to practice medicine. And this gave me comfort and it gave me peace before he started probing and poking at my eyes, right? So this is the next thing that we can do, brothers and sisters, and it's something that this community has done a very good job at, which is before we let scholars and imams and, and spiritual leaders come into our communities, we really vet them and see where did, did they get their training from? If we have this high level for people who are taking care of us physically, what about people who are taking care of us spiritually? 
right? Our, our scholars are our spiritual doctors, and so they also need to have a high level. MashaAllah, our beloved Imam Bilal, if you want to ask where he got his credentials from, if you want to look at his pedigree and his degrees, you can, no problem. You, I know his teachers, everyone does. We know the institution, you can see what he studied, and that gives us comfort before we al uh, allow him to teach us. And Alhamdulillah, that's been happening, and look at the beautiful uh, changes that are happening in our community because of that. So these are some of the things that we can start to do as a community, brothers and sisters. And last but not least, the sixth thing and the most important thing from a spiritual perspective, what can we do? We can start to connect ourselves to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We can start to connect ourselves to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and study his sharia and uh, study his seerah and to study his shama'il. These are two things that I would recommend uh, first and foremost to myself and then everyone else to study. Because when we look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and we look at how he treated individuals and how he carried himself, we see subhanAllah there was no spiritual abuse here. La hawla wa la quwwata la billah. Astaghfirullah. There was no spiritual abuse here. There was just love and care and concern for individuals. When you look at the Prophet ﷺ, you can take so many different examples, we don't have time. But one that comes to mind is when the Prophet ﷺ, it is mass transmitted, that when the Prophet ﷺ was coming into Mecca to conquer Mecca, after everything the Quraysh had done from him, had done to him, how did he enter Mecca? He didn't enter Mecca with his chest out high, riding so high, being so haughty. No, rather there's multiple narrations that the Prophet ﷺ entered Mecca with his torso stuck to his riding beast. His beard was wet with his tears and was brushing up against his camel beast. He was so low to his riding steed, he could barely even look up. This is how humble and how, uh, how much humility our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had. And there's so many things that we can go into about how he treated the, the little girls of Medina, how he gave, him, gave all of his time to them, how he stopped for the, the boy who lost his bird, how he... The, the stories can go on and on about how Rasulullah treated individuals. This was not a man who was concerned with himself. He wasn't calling to himself, but rather he was calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all realize as Muslims that in order to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we get close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the last and final thing that we can do to curb against this phenomenon, is to connect ourselves to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect this community and all communities. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the affairs of the Muslims all across the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our institutions that are producing legitimate legitimate scholars that are guiding our communities. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our scholars and protect them from the fitna and allow them to take care of us as we navigate these uncertain waters that we are entering. Ya Arhamar Rahimin Ya Allah, Ya Arhamar Rahimin Ya Allah. La ilaha illa la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta ya dal jalali wal ikram Rabbi jalni muqimu salati wa min dhurriyati Rabbana wa taqabbal dua Rabbana aghfir li wa li walidiya wa lil mu'minina yawma yaqum al hisab اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين اقامه الصلاه